I wanted to ask you, am I correct that you wrote the song Too Fat to Fly? The song? Yeah, was it did you write a song called No, uh, I was, was involved in an incident that I called and then others adopted as Too Fat to Fly when I got thrown off of a Southwest air airplane and I was tweeting about it. And oh. it fucking went viral. I it think was, it was Johnny Knoxville's cousin, Roger Allen Wade, the country singer who, who wrote, wrote a song, Too Fat to Fly. It might have been after, I'm not I'm certainly not taking inspired, credit, but it but, could have been inspired by that so, so So, wow, that was now getting kicked off an airplane for being too fat? It, it was, they were never, like, they never gave me a clear thing. There's somebody who wasn't from Southwest who was like, look, I know a little bit about airlines. And when an airplane is fully loaded, and that plane was like fully loaded, and I was absolutely the last one on. I was supposed to be on the next flight, but I was like, oh shit, there's a, a seat on this plane? Fuck, I'll get on it. So this person who's involved with airlines is just like, they have weights on planes, and like, you were just the last person on. It wasn't like, you're too fucking fat for this plane. <laughs> they were like, yeah. we're over the weight limit, somebody's gotta go, who's the last person that came on? They're like, that guy, out he goes. How, how much did you weigh at that time? Um, over three bills. I think I weighed my my like uh, area code at that point, 323. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but still, I wore it fairly well. I'm not gonna say like, I, you know, I could fucking fool you and shit, but I, I did, it was always spread out fairly well, so much so that people were like, really, you were that fucking heavy? Um, but yeah, that was, before Citroen, or after the heart attack? That was way before. Way before? Way before. When was the heart attack? Heart attack was four and a half years ago. In, well, four years ago in February that just passed. What does that feel like? It was, didn't feel like a heart attack. You know, I was raised on fucking 70s television, so I was waiting to Fred Sanford that shit. Like, let's You know, you're supposed <laughs> to be big, clutch your chest, <laughs> fucking yell somebody's name. And really, I just couldn't quite catch my breath. And I was between performances. I was doing a show at... Uh, the Alex Theater in uh, pa Pasadena, I think, or Glendale, Glendale. And um, we were shooting them for a Showtime special. You know, when you do a show, that you shoot two shows, and then they combine it into, sure. into one. So we shot the first show, and I got backstage, and all of a sudden I just couldn't quite like catch my breath. And I was like, um, can everyone get out of here? I just want to like, lay down for a second and shit, because we had another show in like 45 minutes. And then I was like sweating profusely and couldn't quite like catch my breath. That was it. Didn't feel anything. Didn't feel chest pain or anything. Uh -huh. And so Jason's wife, Jordan, she runs our company. She was like concerned because she's like, I never see you like this. So she called an ambulance. And at one point, she hadn't told me. At one point, I finally broke down. I was like, you know what? I feel very fucked up. Like maybe we should call it a doctor she's like it's Sunday night all the doctors are closed so I called an ambulance and I was like why the fuck would you do that this is embarrassing I just smoked too much weed that's all the problem is and the first responders came and they these two kids this guy and this girl you know like in production as you're well aware they put together a call sheet uh, for those that don't know that has all the information you need for the shoot that day who's on it who does what or what time you're starting so forth there's also information like in case of an emergency this is the hospital that we go to so there was a hospital on the call sheet that you know was way close to the theater. The kids, the first responders, decided to take me to a further hospital because they were heart specialists. So they made the call. They didn't even tell me I was having a heart attack. They put these fucking leads on me. I was more concerned with how they wanted to like uh, take my shirt off because they're like, we got to attach the leads to you. At one point, the guy went to just hike my hockey jersey up. I was like, whoa! Oh, yanked it down. I was like, every fucking tit I got is going to fall out. And, shit. and he was like, well, we got to get these leads on you. I was like, well, you can fucking reach under. I'll hold out the hockey jersey. You reach under, use my tits to, as a god post and go ahead. So I was giving him a problem because I was like embarrassed and stuff about my body, all my body shame issues. And, whatnot. and they, in the midst of all that, they were like, had presence of mind to be like, this motherfucker's having a heart attack. We should bring him to the heart attack hospital. And so they brought me to Adventist. And, uh, that made the difference. There was this guy, Mark Leidenheim, Dr. Leidenheim, who uh, I get into the to the emergency room, and he's like, uh, hi, how you feeling? And I was like, I feel like fine. I just can't catch my breath. Can't, like I can breathe, but I can't reach the top and come back down. And he was just like, uh, well, uh, you know, what's your pain level on a scale of zero to 10? And I was like, pain? Like negative three? And he's like, oh, that's fucked up. He's like, then you're doing it all wrong. 
I was like, doing it wrong. He's like, yeah, you're supposed to be in a lot of pain when you have a heart attack. And I was like, am I? You're saying I'm having a heart attack? He's like, you're having a massive heart attack Whoa. right now. He's like, we got to go very, very fast. So <sighs> I'm going to meet you upstairs in the OR. And then they turned me over to a guy who was just like, um, I got to shave your groin because that's how the doctor's going to get into your heart. So can you take your jorts off or whatever? And so uh, I was like, um, <laughs> well, I don't want to do that in front of all these people. You know, fucking ER everybody there and i don't give a shit like everybody got their own emergency going on but like we've all been in the er i don't care if your mom's dying sooner or later you look around and be like what the fuck you know so sooner or later somebody's gonna look around and be like is that silent bob and his dick out so i was like i'm not i'm not taking off my my uh George. death before dishonor truly was <laughs> truly was and the dude's like are you kidding we gotta go and i was like well what if i just like pull my fucking jorts over to the side and you could just give me a virgin smoothie or whatever <laughs> And he's like, uh, do you know, realize we're wasting time? I was like, look, man, that dude, that dude who was just here, he told me I had a heart attack. If you make me take my pants off and go dick out in this room, I'm going to have a second heart attack. That's going to be on you. <laughs> so they got me up to the OR, and the doctor's like, why is his pants still on? And the guy was like, he's got body shame issues. I was like, Doc, I got a really small dick. He goes, we don't have time for this. He yanked my shit off like I was in the 70s porn, man, and fucking went to work. So they, in order to, uh, you know, there's many different ways to figure out what's going on in the heart. The doctor suspected it was some sort of blockage or what the medical people call an occlusion. So he uh, threaded a camera up my femoral artery. How to get to it is two ways. They could go in through your wrist or then going through your femoral, which is like in your crotch, in your groin area. So they puncture a hole and fucking go up and they stick a camera up the femoral. And he's like, oh, it's exactly what I thought it was. And I was like, what's that? He's going, uh, you got 100% blockage um, and in your uh, LAD. That's the name of the artery that comes down. Um, so we got to we gotta break it up and, and get a stent in there as soon as Jesus. possible. And he goes, but he's going, you're a comic book guy. You like comic books, right? And I was like, very much. Then he's like, they got a name for this heart attack. It's called the Widowmaker. He goes, wow. doesn't that sound like a bad guy in a comic book? I was like, it does. What's it mean? As if you had to ask. And he's just like, well, in the particular heart attack you're having with the 100% blockage, 80% of the cases, the patient always dies. He's going, but you're going to be in the 20% because I'm good at my job. And he disappeared into my crotch and made magic and shit. So dude saved my fucking life. But while I was on the table... 80-20, you know, I'm no math genius, but I know that those are terrible fucking odds. You know, I figure every time you leave the house, it's 50-50, but 80-20 <laughs> fucking yeah, sucks, worse. man. It's terrible. <laughs> so I started going through the whole, like, you know, well, if my life's going to flash through my eyes, I'm going to start this fucking movie. And just tracked my existence up until that point and thought about, like, everything that worked out and very, very little didn't work out in life. And, like, you know, I was like, well if this is it, like you, you got a good fucking run. Like, yeah, you're only fucking 47, but like packed a lot of fucking crazy living in 47 sure. fucking years. So if this is the end, like, don't be a bitch about it. Just push back from the table, say thank you and fucking go. Don't be the last dude struggling to stay at the party where it's, you got any more fucking beer? Like, just right. go leave the fucking party. Yeah, I love that. Man. I reached the place. I reached a place of like total Zen where I was like, I'm ready. And then motherfucker saved my life. So I had to come back to the land of the living. And that's fucked up when you're like, all right, I'm ready to die. And they're like, well, you're not gonna. And you're like, oh, fuck. It's not like I was suicidal and I wasn't sure. emo and I wasn't like fucking goth. Like, I just want to die, man. But I was like, I get it. Like, my whole life I've been scared of death. And then on that table, maybe it was because he gave me the odds. Maybe it's because I was hopped up on fentanyl. Who fucking knows? But <laughs> yeah. I sat there going like, you know... This, this I remember, you know, I was a big big fan of Neil Gaiman's Sandman book, which is now on Netflix as a show. But back in the day, it was just a comic book. And in the issue about death, his sister Death, who's personified by this like goth girl and shit, she's going around collecting souls all day. You know, people that are dying, they're like, oh my god, I know who you are, and shit. And she takes them wherever they're gonna go. She comes this one guy, older dude, and he's just like, no, no, it's too soon. She's going, yeah, and he's like, well. My whole life, I had this, and he listed all his fucking, like, you know, all the shit he'd been through. He's like, all of that happened to me, and what did, what did I get? And the death character says to him, you got what everybody gets. You got a life. So I was sitting there going, I got a life. And fuck that life. It was great. And it ends. Like, it felt, it occurred to me as graduation. For the first time in my life, I wasn't afraid of death, because I was like, oh, 
you can't stay in high school forever. Sooner or later, you gotta fucking go. Mm -hmm. And I <laughs> felt like, I, I was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> truly. <laughs> I get older, they stay the same age. <laughs> but, but it was like a moment of like, oh, it's, it's natural, it's right. Like it was always, you know, the enemy to me. You know, when you're a creative person or you fancy yourself a creative person or you get paid to do creative things for a living, death is just, fucking a slap in the face it's so insulting it, it's like what i can't end i have important shit to do there's so much here and i just want to thank you for how fucking fascinating <laughs> all of that was well it's the van that brings it up <laughs> and, and uh scott randolph here ha like has watched and continues to watch every night hundreds thousands of video testimonies about nde near-death experiences is that right is that your thing every, every your night before i go to bed i watch uh, this this guy on youtube called lee whitting and he's in bangor maine i'm trying to like reach out to him because i want to meet up with him but he's like a hospital <coughs> chaplain that has a podcast and he interviews people that have died and come back and you know they're hard to stop for four minutes nine minutes Sometimes, I think the record's like 30 minutes. My There's... mom, it happened to my mom. Long before I had a heart attack, my mom has always had like heart problems and shit. And uh, she died on the table. And so she, you know, fucking had a very familiar story about like there was a light. And Did she go to the light? She, she described it. Well, let's all agree that the light is probably the hospital light, you know. Could, uh, no, because sometimes people are saying, like, you know, they're floating above their body. True. And then all of a sudden there's a light in the corner. True. And then they go to it and then they go to a life review, which I'm fascinated by the life reviews. Oh, yeah. She said she saw, like, dad, because my dad died years ago. She saw my grandma. She saw familiar people. And she was like, she, and then she got yanked back. And so I was like, all right, Ma you've been here in this best of all possible worlds for many years and you were there for almost a minute which did you like better and fucking she fucked me up by going like there there and i said why and she goes i felt so light she's gone every fucking pressure and every every hook in me that i felt in life all the shit that i'm responsible for I was I was done. Like suddenly I I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh my god." And she was all that responsibility was was off her. I thought that was really beautiful. And when I was going through my thing, so I don't know if her thing informed my thing, but like I too, once I was just like, "Oh shit, I'm probably going to fucking this is the last ceiling I'm going to see in is in this room." And you know, I was I, I should have fucking like terrified me and shit like that but the 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 hook of it was that like oh this is this is like i you know i, I was raised catholic so there's supposed to be something after this and over the years of course i've let go of that and i've you know i think scott Mosier, we do a podcast where we did a podcast for years called smodcast he had said at one point, he was, you know, he was not raised religious or anything. And Mosier was like, um, you know, I was talking about dying long before I ever almost died. And I was like, what do you fucking think happens after this? Like, you don't believe in heaven? Come on, dude. Like, there's got to be something after this. And he's like, well, you believe in heaven because you were fed that when you were a kid. He's going, but you're way too logical to really believe in that if you step aside and think about it. He's going, I understand that you were raised with it and whatnot, but like... I don't think it's that. And I, he's going, you believe there's a heaven because, you know, you just cannot fucking stand the notion that one day you ain't going to think these thoughts, that the world's not going to share in the glory of fucking you and whatnot. <laughs> and he's like, but I think, I was like, what do you think it is? He's going, I think we're computers. He's going, the computer has a massive amount of information on it. Because that's what I was saying. I was like, how could I just fucking stop and die? Like, I have all this information. And he was just like, a computer is packed with information. It could do amazing fucking things. He's going, and then one day, just hard drive spins down and that's it. Hmm. And I was like, shit. That, that was the first time it, it really impacted with me where I was like, oh, you're right. There is no heaven. And I'm not special. None of us are. And what we have in this life is what we have and what we build and that's the fucking adventure and all these fucking people that are fed a line of bullshit about suffering in this world and fucking 
you know, reward in right. the next is like, what a, f what a fucking, what a f bunch of hokum that is. It's like, you got right. no, nobody fucking knows what's on the other side. And if you really think about it, it's probably nothing. So this is it. Well, the joy is here, man. There ain't no joy after this. It's just, you just wind down like a computer. I, I'm with your mom. You believe I, in the... I, I, yeah, and, and um, I, I believe that all religions effectively uh, point to the same, like, universal truth, which mm. is distilled down to the words, we are one. Sure, you know, how about it? We, we are one. And what we are one means, as I understand it, and I think that this is across all scriptures and, and, and stuff, I mean, to, is that uh, creation, um, everything that exists in the universe is an exercise in God experiencing itself. Because God being one thing cannot uh, have experience because experience is based on r relativity, mm. one thing relating to another. And one thing cannot relate to itself. So Big Bang, whatever creation you want to call it, is this one thing dividing itself into separate particles, which now can relate to one another because there's that, that separation. But the separation is an illusion. It's, it's it's an illusion which allows for, you know, uh, up. There's no up if there's no down. There's no hot if there's no cold. Right. This, these are all relative terms. And so I, another fun way to distill it down, somebody said this to me and it really stuck. We are all eyes in the same head. So to go to... It's fucking good. It's a really good one. That is really good. To go to, to Scott, what Scott bring up with the, the life review... Life review is just beyond uh, indisputable. There's just so much evidence. There's so much. Uh, and life review is like the life, life, life passing before your, eyes. before your eyes. Now, I've read an article um, that's the, a scientific piece that was like, this is absolutely true. Yeah. You do experience your life before you die. And I don't know if it's theoretical or if it's uh, medical, but what they came up with was when the body is going through the trauma of shutting down, which is something we're not familiar with because most of our lives, the body is vital and fucking doing the things yeah. that we want it to do. When the body shuts down, it is traumatic. Like, because the body's not used to like, oh, this ain't gonna be used no more, we're dying, and it, it shuts down. The brain releases a chemical the that DMT. keeps you calm. My, my, my question with that is, the the near death experiences all seem to be the same. Maybe it's DMT releasing from your brain. Mm -hmm. However, the people that do ayahuasca or that do DMT don't have the same experiences as that. And so I'm always wondering, like, if it is the DMT, you never hear somebody come back from an ayahuasca trip saying, "I went to the light. I met my spirit guides." Right. It's always another dimension. Well, there's, there's, I, that's what I've been trying to think about. Is it predisposition like, uh, you know, um, everyone sees the same little green men? Like the mechanical elves? Yeah. Is it just something that somebody, they've been telling this fucking go to the light and hey, you see everybody and your old pets and shit like that? It's interesting. For years, is it just part of us now that like, well, even if you're not a faithful person or a religious person, that is something to cling to in the darkness. Yeah. Like in a world where nobody fucking knows, at least when you got a faith, you're like, well, I put my faith in Jesus and Jesus says it's going to be this. But let's say you don't have a Jesus and all you got is fucking like, well, oh, that, that, I'll take that. Like maybe how, that's how do enough. You, but how do you explain like um, the, one, one of the girls that died, she said, um, you know, I left my body. Mm -hmm. I went into the other hallways and I saw, she's like, I saw my stepdad getting a Coca-Cola from the vending machine Memory. and he came an hour later. And she's like, but I thought it was interesting because he's always like holier than thou exercise guy. And I, she's like, I made a mental note. Like, that's weird. He's getting a Diet Coke. And then she kept going. And then when she came back, she said maybe like, you know, a couple of days later, she's like, did you get a, a Diet Coke out of the vending machine? And he was like, how did you know that? 
and it was like a little secret that he had, or he was eating a Snickers bar. <laughs> I mean, there's like interesting outer body experiences. Oh, well, yeah, there's definitely proof in that regard, but I think it's more simple than whether there's DMT or, or some kind of uh, a physiological thing, because all of these accounts of life review, and again, life review is your life passing before your eyes, mm. is it, they all... T uh, take time out of the equation, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. it's 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 a flash, but it's like the the but you detail, can see the whole story. The, the detail yeah. is time doesn't exist, and then they say they feel everybody's pain that they put exactly. Them through. That's that's what? the thing. Yeah. That that that's the thing. Is that that's common? Yeah, it, yeah. You, 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 all of them w that do have life reviews say dead. they go through and experience everybody's pain that I dead. put them through. I am joy. I've got the gnarliest goosebumps. Well, that means it's true. The gnarliest goosebumps. It, like what? What? Did, the, the concept of we are all one. We're all eyes in the same head. Right. Like this. This uh, illusion of separation. The life review is an is an experience that that does not. Um, Involve time. The detail is is insane. You actually go through your your whole life, and and at the detail that you can't even like describe as a human being. But you go through your whole life, and you experience your impact on everything else. So, so every time you that... made every time you made someone happy, you're gonna feel that joy. Every time you made someone. Uh, every I did time more. Upset I someone. did more pro than than yeah, con, so I'm I, looking I, forward to that. I, but wait, the do you get life review if you live? Everybody, but like if you're yeah. the near death experience, they they've had them. Um, it's like they'll come back and ask if they had a life review, and maybe twenty percent will say no, I didn't. But like the majority are like, yeah. I, I one guy went and he said he his guide took him around. And then he sat him down in a movie theater, and a thing came on, and he watched his movie. Like, there's different ways to do it. Yeah, and, and you can experience how, like, you can experience it, like, as a mosquito that's off in the distance, like, so far away from when you did the most minor thing. Right. And, like, and so it, it, it's just... Uh, I'm it, in. Can you, can you induce this? Huh? <laughs> can you induce it? Yeah, they, they. I guess in the East Coast they have. Um, they they shut off your senses and they're trying to recreate. So when they put you in like a an outer sensory body sensory deprivation, something time? there's a. I, I've been trying to look into it and I want to pay for it to do it. You're a fucking yeah. searcher, man. Look yeah. at you. You're a seeker. Good for you. Uh, I, have you ever Have you ever been to a place that you thought was familiar? Like I, I, what I mean by that is like I think in a past life I was Vietnamese. Is that right? I think, in, and I was also Brazilian because I have like a weird kinship with Vietnamese people. And when I went to Vietnam, I was like, "Oh, this is familiar." Do you have anything like that? And I've always loved Canada for no explicable reason, <laughs> so I must have been Canadian, and that makes a lot of fucking sense, you know? Because Canadians are good people in general, so they, of course, they'd be reincarnated. You know, they'd yeah. be like, "You're coming back. Yeah. You did it right. You get to do it again." Yeah, maybe in a past life, you're a Canadian. I think so. I, it's got to be. There's no good reason to explain why I like Canada as much as I do. I'll there, buy it. They, and it's and it's interesting because both of you guys. I mean, me, and me too, and everybody. Like, I feel so blessed in this life. Me too. Yeah. And I and I and I was asking me somebody about well. that, and they said because be you were too. probably an, uh, evolved in a in a previous life, and like you, it's like kind of like a karmic. You know, I'm really enjoying this life. And the yeah, only way yeah. I can explain it is that, like, I must have been a really good person in a previous life. I'll, is that? I don't know. what. The, ah. I mean, look, I'll take that because I like that. But so do shit heels get a better life next time around or does their life get worse? I, I think, like, back? maybe murderers get reincarnated a little bit lower on the life. Uh, I, I, mean, I don't know. I think, I think you're looking at it, like, far too simplistically. and um, And I think that... Well, in conversation with God, he asked him how many lives he's had. He's like, 700, or whatever he said. Right, 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 right. I mean... But you could choose to come back to this world if you want when you go to the other side, or you can go... I, it's the soul contract. I mean, do you want to explain this, that? They, 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 there's there's, there's a, a soul contract where, like, you uh, you have, like, a blueprint for what you want to, uh, to experience, learn. what you want to uh, remember, what you want, you know, you choose your parents, you... Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you go into this and and the contract that w which we uh, enter into you know as we before we incarnate as a body like the deal is that once you incarnate as a body like you forget the the whole deal that's like uh, there was a movie years and years and years ago in the 
late 80s, maybe early 90s, called Angel Heart with Mickey Rourke. Ooh. And he was, uh, it was a detective gumshoe yeah, kind of Lisa movie. Lisa Bonet. Lisa Bonet, where they, the side story to that, allegedly, I wasn't there, I wasn't even in the movie business, but allegedly they actually had sex while they were shooting their sex scene. Wow. That's like, if you go on the internet, there's lots of stories about that. In any event, it's a story about a guy, Mickey Rourke's a detective who's hired by Robert De Niro plays a character named Louis Cipher. Figure that out. Um, he wants him to track down this guy, Johnny Angel, who owes him something. And so Mickey Rourke's looking for this fucking guy the whole movie. And spoilers, in the third act, you find out that he was Johnny Angel and he made a deal with the devil to like become fucking famous and shit like that. And they tried to renege on the deal with the devil and forgot who he was was and so the devil had come to claim his fucking soul and sent him to look for it and shit like that wow. now when clerks happened to me in 1994 i you know i was now i'm like you i'm an outsider artist like there was no manifest that that was going to happen i lived in new jersey the fucking it's not like i lived in california Wait, it wasn't manifest that you can make a hit movie with twenty seven thousand dollars go figure <laughs> go figure <laughs> i really yeah. tried. i was looking for the manifest and there was none. so when we clerks like not when i made it but when it got bought and when it was clear that like oh my god like my dream is actually going to come true i was convinced that i had angel hearted myself that I had made some deal with the devil, and mm. part of the deal was that I would not remember until it was too fucking late and shit. Now, I still got time in this life. I hope I don't find out that's the fucking case. But I like the notion of the soul contract where it's just like, you're gonna, you get to pick and choose the menu, but you ain't gonna remember any of this shit. Right, I'm like, like also a, a big researcher, a big thing, and this, one hang up that I have with the, 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 because in the soul contract, in the blueprint for life, which we agree to, um, there are predetermined events which are just going to happen. And I can't. Pre existing conditions? Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> Fuck. They're, Even they're, after they're, life, there's pre existing <laughs> conditions? There's, uh, well, not pre existing, but predetermined, mm -hmm. like things that are going to happen. And I just cannot reconcile, uh, free will with predetermination yeah that's an interesting conversation like how to, how, that, that's what i want to ask it's a big Neil thing Donald for lifelong Walsh. catholics man it's just like yeah. well i'm responsible but i'm not there's a right. grand design so if right. i sin that was what god wanted right now i don't want to alienate people who are religious i've got all kinds of uh, people who are religious who i love and respect with that said, I think that this idea of heaven that we were talking about before is so self-serving. It's like, I'll be like, I'll, I'll be good so that I can get into heaven, yeah. you know? And like, there's the, a reason for your, for your, uh, compassion because you're like, well, right. I, I get something. It's, exactly. It's very, uh, mm -hmm. it's very and it's like, And then the question is then, what is that righteous? Well, is it, is right. it, if good things are coming from, an act that is not 100% righteous. Right. Is it... Right. Is it good? Is it going to be righteous? Still? Exactly. If you're like going like, well, I'm doing this. I'm being nice to you. I'm feeding you. I'm clothing you. <laughs> right. But I'm doing it not because like... Yeah, because you want to go to heaven. Because I want to go to heaven. But it's benefiting you. You're sure. fucking getting fed. You're getting clad right. and shit. I think the intention is important. And like... Uh, and what do they say? It's like the, something is its own reward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Virtue, yeah, virtue it, is its own reward. Yes, I think there it, it is. You're doing it because right. it's the right thing to do, not because you're like, well, somebody's going to pat me right. on the back. Yeah. I, I saw a comment on a YouTube video that I put up, and it said something about like, oh, you're doing you know, doing everything wrong. It's not too... Like, like, like Jesus can say, you really need Jesus to save you. Right. And like, it just kind of got under my skin a little bit. And I actually responded, which I, I rarely ever do. Do. And I wrote back, I said, I said, you know, you're right. Uh, I'm doing everything wrong, but I'm just going to keep doing everything wrong. And I plan on letting Jesus save me later. <laughs> you know, like, uh, that's Jesus, a good thing Je about Jesus. He'll Jesus, come the last minute. Jesus is cool like that on your deathbed. The last thing you think is like, let me, 
it's like I accept Jesus as my savior and you're good that yeah. washes away everything it, I say and I even said that like between you know I'm gonna accept Jesus and like so that he can wipe away all the bad stuff I do between now and then right. <laughs> you know? right. yeah. and, I mean, and the idea that that holds water it just, it just makes me so mad and that's why I love the life review thing because it's not, it's not a the, the life review is you're not being punished hmm. for for the bad things you did when you experience the the harm that you caused others you're not being rewarded for the joy that you brought people you're just experiencing it as it was it's not a punishment it's not a reward it is just simply the immutable laws of of the universe the law of cause and effect you you experience the, the the you reap what you sowed you know like it's just not good or bad it's just that which is mm -hmm. and that's very very like big in the cosmos you know like it's not yeah. we, we we assign good and bad but in reality there is no good and bad there's just simply the law of cause and effect I am. Um, if somebody had told me the best conversation you're going to have about the afterlife is going to be with Steve-O one day, <laughs> yeah. I would have been like, I'm sorry? What is, are we in heaven when this happens? Are we in the afterlife? He's playing a harp in the clouds. <laughs> exactly. I think that clip was awesome, but not as awesome as my new book, A Hard Kick in the Nuts, What I've Learned from a Lifetime of Terrible Decisions, which is out September 27th, and if you pre-order it right now, you can get the autographed copy. So... Get on it, man. Pre-order my book. It's not going to waste your time because I'm proven, dude. New York Times bestseller. My first book's five-star rated on Amazon. And I have no doubt this one will be, too. So get the autographed copy right now by pre-ordering it at stevo.com. Yeah, dude.